Hi, Virginia Conference. I am here with Bishop Sue Hopper Johnson. We are so glad to have a chance to sit with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we had the great moving day videos. So oh, yeah, thank you. thank you guys for that. That was hilarious. I got a lot of good, good uh, kudos for that. A lot of people thought that was pretty cool. Well, that was neat. I, I don't think a lot of people had seen an Episcopal office before, so that was right. wonderful to hear from you, right. some special things in your office mm -hmm. that you'll look at every day. And I hope people will keep that because it's probably the only time it'll be neat, right? <laughs> it's all downhill from here. <laughs> but we know that Virginia also does have some other questions for you, so we want to mm -hmm. sit down as well and, and ask you some of those questions. Okay, yeah. So first off, very important, how do you like to be addressed? Right, yeah. You know, this caused a little controversy in North Georgia. I'm not a formal person. And, you know, one of the banes of my existence is having a hyphenated last name. I'd really think about that again. But my name's Hoppert Johnson, and that's just a mouthful. Mm -hmm. And when I was, um, when I was uh, up for election as a bishop, a lot of kids were part of my campaign. And, you know, I still remember a friend's kids when they were voting on the floor of Lake Junaluska, uh, they were praying and they were texting me and, you know, and, and Bishop Hopper Johnson is just a mouthful. And so I thought, you know, I, and I was going to North Georgia, which was a really, um, I felt like it needed to be warmer. I felt it needed to be more real. And so it made sense to me to be Bishop Sue. And I, and I think, quite frankly, the same about Virginia. You know, I, um, I'm a very, oh, I'm from Florida, right? And at least I don't wear flip-flops every day. But Florida is a casual place. And I think that um, while there is a time and a place for formality, I think that at the heart of the gospel is relatability and a sense of, warmth and joy and enjoying each other and you know I, it's interesting already I've noticed in meetings people are rushed and they they want to get done and they're like Bishop we know you're busy and we know you've got it and I'm like no I really just want to hang out and have lunch with you so Bishop Sue is just you know it's a uh, it's easy um, people don't have to struggle for hour oh what do we call her how do we and um, you know at the end of the day I thought Dang, if, you know, and this, I'm not in this league, okay? But if Pope Francis can be Francis and Mother Teresa can be Teresa, I can be Bishop Sue. And it's really, I think in the history of the church, you know, you, know, you had Brother Pat and Brother John and Brother, and because um, there is a, there is a, uh, a linkage a relatability, uh, I think that has a deep, is deeply embedded in Christian history. Mm -hmm. That um, that we want, you know, Jesus calls by name. He didn't call her, you know, he calls Mary, Mary. He calls people by name, usually their first name. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me, we only know the disciples by one name, right? So there's a there's an intimacy and a relational quality in a depth of knowing somebody where you call them by name and and that's why I like to be Bishop Sue. That's lovely. And but that's not to say that um, other bishops, you know, it's not like I mind that they go by their last names. That's fine. And I think in some some cases, yes, there is the formality needed, but I never have sensed that in my setting. Gotcha. So. So can you tell us, for people who might not know, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Florida. I have two younger sisters. I'm the oldest. Um, always had to set the example. Always had to be the high achiever. Um, I'm recovering in that way. Uh, but uh, my dad was a service manager for General Telephone. And his name was in the phone book. If you had a complaint with the telephone company, you would call my dad. And uh, he was the most patient, even-keeled, uh, devoted, just a wonderful man. Um, and sometimes when I have somebody complaining, I have to channel Pete Hoppert because he never got upset. He always, you know, he dealt with a problem well. And so I think at my best times, I, I channel him. 
Uh, he also, <laughs> I call him, and you'll hear me call him Stingy Pete, man. He, he hated money to be wasted. Uh, actually, my sister's even worse than I am. She, you know, she really, my um, husband used to hope my sister Donna got her, uh, his name for the annual mm -hmm. gift giving at Christmas because Donna can make 50 bucks go farther than any human being on the face of the earth. But uh, so I am a real fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. I watch every penny. Uh, I, I think I freaked out David, your treasurer, because I asked to see like the investment analysis in a mm -hmm. balance sheet. And he's like, wow, never. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I have a degree in finance. So I'm always, how do we, you know, get, get the biggest impact for resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was a school teacher. She taught fourth or sixth grade for 35 years. Um, and I am amazed she would, you know, teach all day, come home, make dinner, run our household. I still don't know how she did mm -hmm. it. Um, she's still alive. She's 87 mm -hmm. and, and still runs her household, lives independently. Um, and then uh, my, my husband, Alan, I met, actually I met at church. He was the chaplain at Florida Southern College and I was the associate pastor at First United Methodist in Lakeland. Mm -hmm. And we would hang out on Sunday night and talk about life in the church and he would make soup. And you know, I was dating somebody else and a couple years after we started doing that, I realized I liked hanging with him mm -hmm. more than anybody else. And so, uh, but a friendship that just blossomed into more. And uh, one of the most embarrassing nights of my life was when we played newlywed game with a youth group and we were horrible. We couldn't even figure, <laughs> when was our first date? I don't know. You know, it was like so seamless. I, yeah. I don't know when our first kiss was. I don't know. So we're terrible at that. Um, our daughter, Samantha, is 21 and uh, is about to graduate from college, <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> she uh, is majoring in history and art history and uh, is excited to get a job. Uh, she doesn't really want any part of graduate school right now. She's tired of school, so she's eager to get a job. And she is an urban person. Mm -hmm. She, We took her to New York City when she was about 13, and she lit up. And so she will probably be interviewing anywhere from D.C. to Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, I've been blessed with a great family. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's a tremendous gift and um, still tight-knit. Um, you know, my grandparents were married for 50 years. My parents were married for 50 years. I don't think I'll be married for 50 years. I didn't get married till I was 84. I mean, 84 <laughs> until I was 34. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, very deeply knit, solid family. And um, I love to get together with my sisters and their families and the extended family. And um, all of our summer vacations growing up were at the beach. Mm -hmm. And so we would spend usually a month at the beach and um, we would go crabbing together we would fish together any kind of seafood I've caught mm -hmm. and you know those family gatherings I have great memories of sitting with my aunt at 2 in the morning um, with about 50 crabs cleaning them so I'm definitely a Florida kid mm -hmm. yeah so this is your second Episcopal assignment mm -hmm. um, what do you think you carry with you from North Georgia to Virginia? Hmm. I think even more of a great love for the church and a new appreciation. Uh, I love the name of Eugene Peterson's book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places. And I have a sense now of um, how many different places Christ speaks to. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I learned in North Georgia is uh, how vast and wonderful and varied expressions of United Methodism are, from rural to urban to, you know, mountains to beach, you name it. It was just an amazing thing to watch. And the giftedness and the, how people pour their lives into the connection I think it was amazing to behold. It's a complex system. Mm -hmm. I think I bring that to Virginia. Uh, Florida was too. There's, you know, talk about huge diversity, huge variety of people, um, huge scope of ministry. And um, 
lots of resources, lots of demands, lots of um, lots of refereeing, mm -hmm. <laughs> competing interests, and how do we focus? And so I think I bring from North Georgia a new sense of focus and how do we how do we you know make our resources go as far as they can? How do we um, and North Georgia really, and Florida too, was a real crucible for new expressions of ministry. Um, we had learned both in Florida and North Georgia that you can start churches all day long, but that's not the secret formula. That both of those annual conferences spent about $10 million in new church starts, and uh, very few of them succeeded. And so I think Part of what we have to do is just acknowledge we're in a new era of ministry, a new day, and uh, increasingly the people we seek to introduce to Jesus have no understanding of church, have never been to church, or worse, they have a bad impression of church. And so uh, in the fresh expressions lingo, we call that the nuns and the duns. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, to have I think I come from North Georgia with a clear understanding that there are no easy answers mm -hmm. and one size does not fit all. And we're in a new era of ministry that we have to figure out together mm -hmm. and see how the Spirit leads us. And to me, it is terrifying but exciting. I think it's a great time to be in ministry. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So the Virginia Conference has been under a vision, a conference vision since 2017 mm -hmm. up to be disciples who are lifelong learners who influence others to serve. Do you, as a bishop, are you planning on casting a vision? Is that something <laughs> that's in your priorities? You know, I, I think I've never been one of those who um, thinks that the leader casts the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I lead the conversation but uh, vision usually comes, I think, bubbling up from the grassroots. Okay. And I don't think, and I think it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So 2017 is light years ago, right? And um, I really learned, I served a small church and I struggled, we all struggled with vision. The church council and I, what's our vision? What's mm -hmm. our vision? What's our vision? And after I'd been there about three years and we had focused on studying scripture and focused on our community, uh, it was a, it was a, um, suburb, it was a rural community becoming suburban, mm -hmm. but it was forgotten. There wasn't any, there weren't any services. It was a forgotten area mm -hmm. of the county. And I remember we were in a church council meeting and a woman who was not even a major leader in the church just said, you know what, I think we're supposed to be the beacon in the middle of this region mm -hmm. and we are supposed to be the ones to provide services to this community or be the place where they can find it. And there was our vision. I mean, it came up, it was organic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm not going to take three years. I think at the end of the day, the heart of the vision is always, how do we introduce people to Jesus? Mm -hmm. And that looks different in every setting. But I also think from our Wesleyan heritage, there always has to be part of the vision is to be, to be transformed individually, right? I should be more like Jesus mm -hmm. today than I was yesterday. So there's the, the transformation of the individuals, and then that leads to the transformation of the culture because uh, I don't think you can have the mind of Christ and not be vitally concerned with those in your community who he would be in ministry mm -hmm. to, right? So the vision, I think, always is about personal transformation, community transformation, and introducing those who don't know Jesus mm -hmm. to him. And um, whatever vision we have will include those things. I know that people are excited. Obviously, we are just in your first month here in Virginia. <laughs> yeah. But can you share what your priorities are for the conference? Yeah, my priorities are um, leading the conference to focus on the people not in the church yet. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the conversations we have especially when you're talking about disaffiliation, oh, who are we going to lose? Or I'm like, you know what? 
last time I noticed there were fewer than 1% of any community in a United Methodist Church. So what about the what about the 80% of people who have no faith community? What about the, that to me should occupy all of our time. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think a change of focus and also a change in focus on generations not here yet. Um, a lot of the conversations I have are with uh, older people who I think desperately want to see the church like it was in 1950. And that day is come and gone. Mm -hmm. And so how do we creatively talk together about reaching new generations? And um, so I, that's how I want to lead the annual conference, and in a joyful way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get so tired of going to church meetings where people are mad and upset and angry and cranky. I'm, I'm just done with that. I want to look for joy. And um, <laughs> there's a great old Bible study called Experiencing God by a man named Henry Blackaby. He was a Baptist minister. But the best part of that was um, he, uh, that I took from that, and I think it's so true. You look for the Holy Spirit. You look where, where God is at work, and you join God there. So I think our priority will be looking at this annual conference, looking at Virginia and saying, where is God at work, and how do we join God in that work? And how do we do it in a joyful way? And how do we incorporate new people in that ministry and new gifts? Um, I've been, um, <laughs> well, years ago, Alan and, I, Alan and I went to the bishop in Florida and we said, we want churches that are in trouble. Hmm. You know, we want churches that have resources, that have potential, but are really in trouble. And so funny, it's like steady work. But we would go into those churches and they would have financial problems and they would have leadership problems. But what we found was usually the issue was with leadership and inwardly focused leadership held tightly. Mm -hmm. And so what we would watch for were the amazingly gifted people who were on the periphery, right? They'd sit at the edge of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. They weren't in the middle of things. And we found that we had more, they had more than enough gifts to fuel the church. Mm -hmm. And so I think that part of this is to um, bring in new leaders, bring in new ideas, bring in new energy, mm -hmm. bring in joy. And if you're not joyful, I'm to the point where I just really don't want to work with you. <laughs> I'm to that yeah. point. I'm, you know, I'm just tired of, uh, who was it who said, who, oh gosh, what was the quote? Uh, somebody was talking about, oh, it was a comedian who described Methodists as those who'd been sucking on lemons all day. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and I've met some of those. Yeah. And it's just, it, it's not, it, it's, it's not only, I don't think it represents Christ well, mm -hmm. but it's, who wants to come be a part of that? Yeah. So, I yeah. That's beautiful. Especially yeah. coming from the pandemic, you know, we're slowly trying to get away from that, but choosing joy, right, finding joy. Right. I think that's a vision that I think we all want to reach for. And well, and I think that's why Paul says, I mean, he writes to this church in conflict, whatever is worthy mm -hmm. of praise, think on this, right? Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in the negativity and the ugliness because it'll consume you. Mm -hmm. And even in the name of Christ, and I'm, you know, I just don't, I don't think that's healthy. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I early in my early in my training as a bishop, I, I and I don't know who said it, but I I was reviewing my notes and in big letters I'd written "fill your day with health," hmm. and I've tried to do that ever since. So I'm going to be filling my day with health, filling my day with the Methodists who want to be United mm -hmm. Methodist, who want to stay United Methodist, who love the United Methodist Church, and those are the people I want to lead. Mm -hmm. And so, somebody long ago said, you know, Sue, don't worry about the people who don't want to follow you. Mm -hmm. So anybody who wants to be led, anybody who wants to be United Methodist and love it and embrace it and be connectional and introduce people to Jesus and be joyful, mm -hmm. I'm your person. Well, if I not, I'll retire, right? <laughs> Well, I know we have clergy and laity around the conference. They are just gearing up, ready to meet you. Uh -huh. Can you share how you're going to be going around the conference? What right, is yeah, I'll be working with the cabinet next week on this. But ideally what I'd like to do is 
Um, I will use it as a time to get to know the superintendents because, you know, I, I don't know them well. Mm -hmm. And I find if they drive you around their district for a day, you get to know them pretty well. Um, but uh, usually what I'd like, and this is what I'm going to talk to them about, I'd like to be in a district, preach in a church on a Sunday morning that they think would be helpful, mm -hmm. you know, an influential church or a church that just would enjoy a, a visit from me. And I leave that to their discretion. And then meet with, um, usually Sunday afternoon or evening, meet with a group of laity and I let them decide who that will be and how that group is comprised. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, meet with the clergy. And um, after that, you know, Monday and Tuesday, just drive around, uh, show me parts of the district that are exciting, it really involved in ministry. Sometimes they'll line up uh, ministries and I'll just we'll drive over there and meet whoever's mm -hmm. leading that ministry. Or, you know, if they need something that uh, is of concern to them, they'll show me that. But uh, to me, that's a really valuable time mm -hmm. and one of my favorite times. And so um, I'd love to make it to all eight districts. The four annual conference is going to be a, it's going to be a, a real uh, sprint. Mm -hmm. But I think we can do it. Mm -hmm. And I found that that helps me use my time most efficiently and get, know, get to know the most mm -hmm. people. So along that same line, as we are so excited to meet you, how can people anticipate being able to hear from you? Kind of what's your communication style mm -hmm. um, conference-wide? Um, yeah, I like this. <laughs> I like this. I love it. <laughs> I, like, I like podcasts. I like, I'm a video person. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about you, but I see like three-page writings from bishops, and I'm like, I, I read two paragraphs. I don't know about you. Um, I just think that, I, and I want you to hear it directly from me. So um, it'll be a lot of video, a lot of, you know, if, if a statement needs to be made, I'll write a short statement. Um, but I, I think that um, I love podcasts and I'm not a good blogger, mm -hmm. I'm not a good blogger. But we look forward to some podcasting in our future. Exactly, so. exactly, yeah. Do you anticipate any kind of a larger preaching schedule other mm -hmm. than what you already talked about? Yeah, I usually, um, I know in North Georgia, most Sundays I was preaching. Mm -hmm. And um, I love that. I enjoy that. And so, um, and, and a lot of it is, you know, a lot of it is anniversary preaching, right? Churches, anniversaries, 150 years, mm -hmm. 200 years. Um, and uh, usually, just fair warning, it's usually the same sermon, congratulations on your anniversary, now go, or a building, right? Yeah. Uh, I do a lot of building <laughs> stuff, and my, and my message is always, okay, congratulations on the new building, now get out of it, right? <laughs> but um, I, um, yeah, the, I, I, the, more, the more Sundays preaching, the better. Mm. Um, and, and usually the DSs will funnel requests for that, and uh, Terry Biggins, my assistant, will figure out how that sorts out. You know, it was really hard when I got to North Georgia and a similar Virginia. Actually, there are more churches in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, to realize that if I wanted to go to every church on a Sunday morning, it would take 18 years. So, wow. <laughs> so that's sad. But I do like I do like going to some churches that you know will say we've never had a bishop come, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think the funniest, I, I was traveling in the, in the um, Holy Land and had breakfast with a couple, and one of them was a pastor, and he said, I'd really love for you to come preach at my church, and I really enjoyed them. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Well, I didn't realize it was like the most remote mountain church, <laughs> and it did work out that I, I, I planned to go, and um, it snowed. I mean, it the weather was awful. And they were so upset and so sad. I said, listen, just the Sunday after this happens to be open. Let's just push mm -hmm. it back a Sunday. And then I rethought that as I drove up. I mean, I'm a Floridian, and there's snow banked <laughs> on each side of the cars. So, uh, uh, it was awful. But, uh, but it was a joyous time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that um, to me nothing's better than to go and be a part of a worship service and to see um, 
people in worship and have them tell me about their church. That's that gives me great joy. Mm -hmm. One final question: mm -hmm. What is there anything else you want the Virginia Conference to know about you? To know about your leadership? To know about what's what you think is ahead for the Virginia Conference and the denomination? Right. I I think. Um, well, the first thing I'll say, I, uh, I walked into a cabinet in North Georgia and I knew a couple of those DSs mm -hmm. were not thrilled, right? They weren't thrilled that a woman was their bishop. They weren't thrilled over a lot of things. And uh, one of them retired like a year in. And um, anyhow, he came to my reception when I left, mm -hmm. which I, I was really, really honored. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to know that um, I did have misgivings in the beginning, but I really appreciate your leadership over the last six years. And then he said something that really meant a lot to me. He said, I want to thank you because you always listen to us. Mm -hmm. And so I want the people of Virginia to know that I don't have all the answers. I know very little about Virginia. Mm -hmm. I know an awful lot about the Holy Spirit because I've been following it my whole life. I know a lot about Jesus because I'm in connection with him every day. I know a lot about the church because I've seen it where it works and where it doesn't work. But I also know that the minute I presume to know anything, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I will listen and I will absorb and I will, I will discern and I will lead the best way I can based on what I learn. Um, I would say that um, I am very excited for the future of the United Methodist Church. I think that if you look at the younger generations, if you look at what, I want to get us back to the church of 1750, 1780, when it was a movement. Mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit was moving and the Methodists were out beating the bushes and talking about Jesus to people who'd never been included before. Mm -hmm. That's my vision. And I, th you know, it was interesting. I think United Methodist Communications pointed out that when they do polls of people who aren't involved in a church, they say, if you would, if you would try a church, where would you go? Mm -hmm. The vast majority say the United Methodist Church. Those are the folks I want to connect with. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited by the young, the young leaders in our church, the clergy. God is still calling amazing people. I would think if God was done with the United Methodist Church, it wouldn't call them. And the young clergy and the young laity are fantastic. Mm -hmm. So how do we listen to them and let them lead the church in its next generation? I think that's important. And um, I think that... Uh, my word is, if you don't love the United Methodist Church, we want to say, you know, go build what you want to build as God is calling you. But don't disparage the United Methodist Church. Don't undermine us. Don't talk trash about us. Don't be ugly. There's no need for that. If you want to sell your new church, sell it with the positives. Mm -hmm. Sell it with the, and, and people can compare, compare vision for the future. But I don't think it's, it's fair to undermine and disparage and try to, I just don't see Christ saying, good job, you mm -hmm. stole your first congregations. So um, I would say if you want to be United Methodist, it's going to be a great run mm -hmm. and it's going to be a great future. And I think it's more adapted to the world we're facing than anything else. And so let's continue the work that John Wesley started where he saw that the Holy Spirit transforms individuals mm -hmm and transformed individuals can't help but transform their communities. And that is a compelling vision. It's one that I've given my life to. And anybody who wants to join along, mm -hmm. more than happy to have you come. It's going to be a great ride. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your words, Bishop, and just the joy that you exude. Um, huh. I'm, I'm excited to work with you, <laughs> and I know our Virginia Conference is getting ready to welcome you. Please remember that Bishop's installation service is on February 11th and it will be live streamed. Um, Great. But we Good. Are yeah, my mom wants to watch. So. Yay. <laughs> so, we are just excited to welcome you. Great. So, thank Glad you. Glad to be here.